John Tweed, welcome to the Leadership Factory Podcast. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. Hey, Coach, it's a pleasure for you to be here today. Hey, I'm, enjoy I'm, I'm enjoying it already. We're just getting started. Well, we had to get our juices flowing a little bit. You yeah, know? there you go. You've, so, got me, you've got me prepped and ready to go. Yeah, hey, you, you, you were ready when you were born, Coach. Let's go. <laughs> hey, just a real quick, just to set the premise here for everybody that's listening. So over 37 years of being a leader, a trainee, a frontline leader, middle level executive, and a business owner, I've found one conclusion to leadership. And the definition that we use in this podcast is a leader is a person who can inspire another person to take a journey that they're not willing to take by themselves. Amen. So the whole premise is that everybody, all the listeners, we're trying to help them inspire another word, another person. Amen. So and today's going to be a very inspirational discussion between me and you. How do you do that? So well, we're going to be so. talking about how, how did people affect us? Then we'll let it go from there and where it takes us, where we're trying to help people in our audience become that inspirational leader. Sounds good. Let's go. I think you game, coach. I think you got this. So hot question right out of the gate. Who is your best leader and why? So what do you know about them? What do you see them do? And how did they make you feel? So um, I'm, my story's a little different. My career's a little different. And then I've actually only had two leaders in my entire career. Um, one was really early on. And then I went through a period where I was kind of on my own as a leader, owner of the company and leader. And then um, after we sold the company, I got the privilege of working for a guy that was really inspiring to me. So, and I would say both of those leaders were really um, good in their own way. And I'm going to quickly just kind of take you through what I mean by that. But if you look at Scott and Iswanger, who um, I started working for right out of college. I mean, I was 21 maybe. And, um, you know, he was just such an encourager. I mean, the guy, I, I was crazy enough that I would do anything and try anything. And if you put a challenge in front of me, you know, I was going to do it, right? I never I never thought I couldn't. But what was uh, remarkable was how he encouraged me and how he allowed me to take on things that I didn't have the resume for. Right. And he would, you know, give me the uh, room to make mistakes and be OK with that. But he gave me some unbelievable. I mean, I can remember uh, other parts of the pieces or people in the management team would look at him like he's crazy when he would allow me to take on roles and responsibilities. And it was, you know, it was really all I needed because it was that confidence that he had. And he had more confidence in me than I had myself, but it wore off on me. Right. I mean, he, he his inspiration and encouragement is what got me to the point in life where, you know, I, I don't have other words and this may not sound great, but there wasn't anything that once I decided, I just pretty much figured out I was going to do it. You know, typically getting me to decide I was going to take on a challenge was the <laughs> biggest. But once I once I took it on, I was I was good to go. I'm going to I'm going to do this. Because you're an all in dude, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. I'm all in cuz once I decide I'm in, I'm in. Because you can't optimize your own performance if you don't get all in. Right. It's sort of like a person trying to you, you're a leader, you're an entrepreneur, and you're going through the woods, so you're knocking these trees down and somebody's on your bus. They got to get in if because they're half in or half out. I mean, they're they're giving you wind shear and they're slowing you down. Right. Because Mr. Nyswanger saw you as someone helping you push through the trees because you exactly. got all in on what it, what was going on there. So. Yeah, and he was just um, amazing. I, I wish – I were that encouraging in my leadership. I mean, he was just that amazing that he would, uh, he took risk in me that no one else would. And like I said, there were people on the management team, the senior leadership team that would look at him sometime. <laughs> Can't believe you're going to let this kid do this, but okay, we'll see how it works out. 
And then the other privilege I had was working for David Parker at Covenant. And David taught me a faith-based leadership style that was beyond anything I'd ever seen. You know, um, David truly led his business with prayer. And he made the decisions even... Um, he did the right thing even when it cost him money. And when he was confronted with needing to make a difficult decision, he did it in his prayer closet. And I, there were times I questioned that. He And he also allowed me to do things with his company that other people, we made such a um, dramatic change in how his business was structured and operated. There were a lot of people questioning uh, whether letting me do that was the right thing. And he gave me, you know, every time I go to David with something, he'd be like 110%, let's do it. And, you know, and it's paid off. But I think it's because um, the strength he had in his faith in God, and he prayed about, hey, God, should I let this guy do this and evidently God told him yes because he he gave me a lot of latitude and it's paid off you know they've got a, they've got a great organization they've got a great leadership team and they're generating phenomenal results yeah I met Mr. Park I was had the pleasure to meet him he's a very nice guy oh, I love David oh he's, that's good he's a close yeah. friend and yeah. um, I, I you know when we sold the company, I was only supposed to stay six months, and it was my love for David that initially got me to stay longer because I had a lot of plans in my life, you know, that we put on hold so that we could help him accomplish the things they've done. But he's That's a phenomenal awesome. individual. That's right. That's right. So a leader could be anyone in your life just to tear those walls down for you. So it could be a coach, a teacher, a friend, aunt, uncle, mom, dad, grandparents, whoever inspired you to do something where you didn't think you could do it by yourself. Right. Because I know you're very confident in yourself. So it's like, you, you just got to get bought in because some of the key words here, the people listening today, to me, the biggest word that I got out of your conversation there was trust. Right. And there's trust involved. There's magic. Because trust is the electricity to the inspiration. Right. Because without trust, you can't inspire. That's true. That's you, true. It's out. If you don't have trust, and the definition I use for trust is trust is when you fully depend upon or fully rely upon someone's character and or their abilities to help you get what you want. Because they trusted you. However they did that, there's just something inside all of us that we either trust or don't trust. Can we explain it? I don't know. But if you get someone to trust you, because I have, have like 10 to 20 ways to build trust, because once you build trust, you can inspire. Once you can inspire, you can be creative. Once you're creative, you can solve problems and you can optimize customers, teammates, and problems. Yeah, and the only thing I would say about that is, um, and maybe it's just a play on words, I, I would use the word faith because, you know, trust is something that can be built over time. And in both of these situations I described and in both of these leaders, they didn't know me long enough to have trust in me. They had faith in me. And that came from somewhere else, right? I mean, um, you know, probably initially gave me trust I didn't hadn't earned yet. <laughs> but somewhere in their faith, they saw or God told them, you know, this is an opportunity. Let it, let it roll. So, That's good. That's good. That's good. So who's your worst leader? And why? Don't have to name anybody. Yeah, you can, be, not, you can think, be in that whole your world from zero to 22 because you're just 22 today. So in that whole world, who was someone who demotivated you? Um, well, I know you can't be de demotivated because well, you're, you're, you're an overcoming person. So I think, who's I, I, someone that didn't really hee-haw with you and why? So I'm going to use the word the, or the name Fred. Okay. And Fred, um, his leadership style was one of which really was just conflict. And it was um, because Fred didn't do a good job with articulating 
what someone's responsibility was, how they were going to be measured, and then have feedback. He, he didn't have that tool, so he came up with some disruptive tools to help him figure out whether people were doing what they were supposed to do or not. And it was really uh, disruptive to the team because basically he allowed the team to tell on each other <laughs> to figure out whether it was getting done. And, you know, I'm a big accountability guy, Greg. As a matter of fact, when I went to Covenant, um, David had an instinctive way that he led – and he loved people so much. But when someone like me walked through the door, the thing that I questioned was, are we holding people accountable? And we had a long conversation. As a matter of fact, I spent some time before I had the conversation with David going through the Bible and identifying what the Bible said about accountability. Because I knew nothing else would speak to him. And when we put P&Ls and metrics and measurements and feedback in place, not only for each department, but for some of the people, um, the organization lifted up rapidly from, one, having those metrics, and two, developing some expectations of what should be accomplished. And um, phenomenal results. So I guess... The only, what I would say about Fred is he, he didn't really have a functional way to articulate responsibility, uh, measurement expectations, and feedback. And that creates a lot of confusion and disruption among the organization and team members. And my wife has a saying that she uses on me all the time. Clear is kind. Kind is clear. Because Fred... He wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. And I've I've been with leaders like that. They like to create confusion because they want to see how everybody reacts to the confusion. But that's exhausting. I mean, I've been on those teams where my leader, Fred, they were just all about creating confusion. Yeah. And that, that didn't work for me because, one, I wasn't that type of player. Uh, people who are subject to intimidation – operate well in that environment. And unfortunately, as my wife says, I don't have that attribute. I don't even have a place where it goes. So, <laughs> Oh, that's right. Because that's right. <laughs> yeah, if you want people to think independently, <laughs> but they got to be a part of a team, but they got to still think independently, but they got to come into the team. And because the toughest thing I've done to be on a team is surrender my rights to the leader. Right. But I will do that if the leader allows me to speak what I feel. Exactly. Because my mentors and leaders at Avery Express allowed me to speak, even though I was a wild and rambunctious, let him, let him talk. Right. Then they would decide what to do. But I was so thankful that they allowed me to speak. Yeah. Amen. Then they, they, they just allowed me to speak. They wanted to hear what I had to say, which gave me value, made right. me trust them. It made me dig harder. It made me learn harder. It made me read more books. It made me study more trade journals. How can I help them become better? Well, and, that, and that's key. I mean, I, I'm i not always great at this, even as a parent, but that, that point you just made about empowering others by listening to them, you know, making them feel valuable um, just to hear what they have to say and my son holds me accountable for that because I'm not always great at it. And, you know, I'm always wanting to talk about what I want you to do. Right. And <laughs> um, he, he will, I mean, he will passionately sometimes say, Hey dad, check yourself. You need to listen here for a second. And um, he, I've grown a lot because of people like him. You know, you knew, you knew my team at, and uh, they weren't yes people. Right. I mean, they, we were we had a process for uh, what I call fighting it out, but then when the when all the everything was on the table, we organized it, aligned and attacked. You know, right? So, um, you know, I, I haven't always been great at that, but fortunately, I guess I've had people around me that required me to be. So it's helped me to develop that skill as well. That's good.
It's good. So if you take your notes, because if it's not on paper, it's vapor. I'm just going to say some things here quick that we've talked about here for the last 10 or 15 minutes. You know, you got to give people room to make mistakes to inspire them. They got to know you have confidence in them. That it, once they see you taking a risk with you, you're going to be inspiring them even more. And there's got to be accountability. There's just got to be accountability. I love one of the things you said. You got to be able to speak your boss's language. Because I have 11 things. Turn your boss into a mentor. Because you got to be able to speak their language. You got to understand their pain points. You got to understand how they process information. Because mm -hmm. if you can't connect to them, they're not going to trust what you got to say. But if you can connect to them, and how they view things, and you speak their language, that probability goes up that they may take that information and use it. Well, I mean, er everyone's a customer, right? Everyone's, Come on, Coach. Everyone's a That's customer. Right. That's right. And you communicate um, accordingly. You know, um, I used to tell folks, who people used to describe me as being a good salesperson. I've even had people say, you know, that's his thing. He's an expert or whatever it sells. Well, the reason I'm good at it is it took me 33 years to find a wife. And I had a lot of practice selling. <laughs> you know, so you it, just gave Tim a big compliment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she deserves more than one. But <laughs> but but I mean it, you know, I, I had a lot of practice that tried to sell this, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and then I learned that you take those same skills with customers and employees and, you know, one, understand what's important to them and then figure out a way to get your message across to them based on that. You tend to have a little more success. Um, and, and like I said, you know, I, I believe God gave me kids to develop me, not for me to develop them. I took, man, you're reading I, off my, I agree. I, I mean, because if I, I, I look at my children today, which all three have accomplished some, some phenomenal things, and I feel like I didn't do anything for them, but they sure have made me a better man. And and that's one of the attributes that, you know, that they've worked on over, over the years as well. But um, yeah, I tell everybody, Trey and Trent raised me. I didn't raise them. Amen, so, brother. Amen. Yeah, because when you take something, that knows nothing and you're responsible to develop their thinking and their belief system. That's a lot of responsibility and there's trial and error and there's wins, there's losses, but it's just a process. Right. It's just a process to go back to, you said something earlier about this is my interpretation. What you said is getting to trust you. You got to stop S T O P spend time on people mm -hmm. until you spend time on people. You can never get them to trust you to well, me. So trust is electricity, the inspiration, and the number one way to build trust is by spending time on people. You know, getting their trust and knowing where they're at. Um, I feel like when you're leading folks and you're trying to move them in a direction and articulate to them what that direction is and what needs to be accomplished, I, I used to say to folks all the time, if you call me and ask me how to get to California, what's the first question I'm going to ask you? Where you at, right? And I think if if I'm going to try to lead you to accomplish an objective, and um, how to accomplish that objective, then first thing I got to understand is where are you at with the topic. What do you think about you know the issue or the or the challenge ahead of us, and then go from there to where the team wants to align around. And so many people forget to try to understand where's where's the individual at. So I'm, I'm getting carried uh, away. I'm going to take up the whole hour if you keep on talking. No, about hey, this is about your con this is, this is, <laughs> People don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from my my, my <laughs> guests. So, I mean, you're, you're speaking truth there. Because It's like if you want X, well, where are you currently? Because right. leaders go to where people are. They don't demand them to come where you want them to be. Because to me, that's the greatest form of honor when you honor someone so much that you'll get off your high horse and you'll walk and meet them right where they're at. Right. I mean, that's just what I heard you say, my interpretation, what you said. Yeah, but you I have to meet people where they're at. I would like for you to think that I'm such a fabulous person that I was 
I looked at it from that standpoint of respect. Unfortunately, I don't know that that's true. I think it's just really I was so driven on helping the team accomplish the objective that these are the things I learned you have to do. Right. Right. Anyway, well, so, so don't make me out to be a great person because if there's anybody watching <laughs> this that knows me, they're going to think they're going to think this is a false podcast. It was just about what I learned you had to do in right. order to lead people in the direction you want them to go. Yeah, and sometimes you don't learn in the middle of it. You learn when you reflect upon it. Because I heard John Maxwell says experiences are good, but reflected experiences are even better. I would agree with that. I would tell you right now, if I went back to work today, I'd be a better leader than I was when I was doing it. Part of that was because of the tail end of my career. Uh, part of that, quite frankly, is recovery. What I've learned going through recovery um, with my family. And, um, you know, David Parker is a big part of that. I mean, he taught me, he taught me a, a way of, faith-based leadership, I'm going to call it, that was beyond anything I've ever experienced in my life. And, man, I wished I'd have had those attributes, you know, 20 years ago instead of the last three years of my career. But you got all, you got you got 30 years in front of you. Yeah. Just not sure what I'm going to do with it yet. <laughs> well, here's a question for you. Who's your unsung hero? Oh, man. Um, there's so many people that are honorable mentions on this, but hands down, uh, number one's my mom. And, um, wow. Um, I get a lot of my spunk and drive and, uh, positive characteristics from my mom, especially with my work ethic and how I approach determination, I guess. But, you know, my, my, my mom and dad, my dad left when I was really young and my mom was a career woman and she pursued a career moving from different towns around. And, but she also single-handedly raised two children and one of them wasn't easy. Is that your is that your sibling? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but she just did it, and you know she never complained. That's the mm. thing that blows my mind. If I when I reflect back over the things as as a three party family we went through together, and mm. you know I was a miserable teenager to to live with. Uh, in my mind, I was really happy, but everybody else around me <laughs> had to endure a lot of misery while I did what made me happy. And um, she just kept coming back, you know, and, and she was always there. Right. Um, she always provided. I mean, you know, our our lifestyle compared to. I guess some others wasn't as elaborate or as uh, luxurious as kids get to enjoy today, but we had everything we needed. Um, but she would bust, she would bust your butt. I mean, you you talking about accountability? <laughs> you 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 got feedback every night when you got home. <laughs> It was more. It was more instantaneous than a video game. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, because she did that because she loved you. Yeah, amen. And, well, and she wanted and, more for you. I think uh, there was a lot of love. There was a little fear. All right, know, but that comes with it. That's right. You know, I learned that. I mean, fortunately, um, you know, Kim and I made a commitment many years ago that we weren't going to leave each other with these kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no one wanted that job by themselves when you look oh, at our kids. Yeah. But 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 my mom did. And I mean, she was there. She she did it all. She never complained. She kept coming back. Um I, is your mom still alive? Oh yeah. Yeah. She's 81 years old and she runs her own, she runs her own philanthropic organization and she's involved in 20 others. And it's amazing. 
We Can I give you a good movie in. to go see with her? Yeah, sure. Unsung Hero. I'll do that. It's, so I brought her to Nashville last week for a for a update appointment at Vanderbilt. Okay. And we just spent 36 hours together after that appointment, just kind of hanging. She'd never been to Bucky's. I took her to Bucky's. Okay. And we went to eat at uh, Sperry's. And she got to help help them make uh, bananas foster. So okay. she had a big time. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I got to do more of that. I got to STOP coach. Yeah. yeah. Do Spend time on people. Yeah. Hey, man. That's good. That's good, coach. That unsung hero, coach, after 10 minutes, I looked at my wife. I said, honey, I've cried four times. I don't know if I can make this much longer. Because <laughs> it, it's a story about struggle. It's a story about we have all this money in a 6,000 square foot house. Then we move down to a house that has no furniture. And it's the struggle of the, of a dad feeling failure, failure and a mom trying to pull. Then they went from Australia all the way to America. Oh, wow. And all those struggles in there. And the unsung many, hero is the mom. How many she's kids? the glue. How many she's kids? the glue. How because many I saw my mom there. I saw my wife there. I saw my my sister's there. I saw aunts there. I mean, it's just emotional because yeah. it's real. It's just a real movie about real life because people struggle in life. It's just what mm -hmm. it is. You know, when but you get there's, when there's you, victory, but there's victory. That's what this, it, it's unsung hero because an unsung hero will lay it all out on the table and they don't know if they're going to win or lose, but they have faith. There's something inside of them that says, don't grow weary and well doing because in due season, I'm going to, I'm going to win if I don't give up. So what creates that? Then they just keep moving. Then this magical ending is amazing. And it's a true story. How many kids were there? Six. Oh, wow. It's an, it's an amazing movie. So Unsung Hero, go see it. Hey, Coach, tell us a little bit about your foundation. Uh, you talking about our family foundation? Yes, sir. Um, so when we sold the company, um, it's kind of interesting all my career, my job was to make the money and my partner did a good, what good job of identifying those places that we would support to, to give back, right. To, to, to help others. And when we sold the company, I became aware of, you know, a new season where um, we weren't, I wasn't, Kim and I weren't going to have someone who did that. Right. Cause we're, we're kind of on our own now. Um, Scott's a unbelievable philanthropist. And um, so we would just, I'd make the money and he'd tell me where we're going to give it. Right. So anyway, in that Kim and I got to talking about it and we were trying to figure out what do we want to do in order to com complete that part of our life. And we got to thinking about, we wanted not only our kids, but our broader family to have the privilege to engage in giving back. And so that's where we decided to put together a foundation. It's, 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 um, very low key from the standpoint of its brand. Our mission is to support causes that lead people to Christ and down. Our definition sometimes gets a little broad because we believe in the Maslow hierarchy and needs approach. And if people aren't getting their basic needs met, they probably don't have time to worry about their spiritual ones. So we try to tend to look at those type of things. Um, I will tell you, if you were to look inside of or look on the website or wherever, the things we support. Can you um, give us the name of it? It's called Tweed Family Foundation. Okay. And um, there's a broad variety of things we support. And a lot of those come from our kids' experiences, you know, things they've struggled with. Um and, and organizations that we've been drawn to because we see others struggle with the same thing. But it's all about meeting people's needs and leading them to Christ. 
And the board consists of my mom, who's a wonderful philanthropist. Um, both Kim and I have sisters that are on the board and then our kids. So that's kind of the decision making. It's a it's low overhead. Um, we don't have any cost. We just give money away. Is, is that something you always thought about doing or is that just something that? No, did, that, that, did God plant that in your heart or did he plant that in your heart through one of your loved ones? Kim. Well, your wife. Okay. You yeah. need to hold on to her, Coach. I thought I might. <laughs> you see, that's why you're good at HR. I told her you're the other day, picker. I said. You're a good picker. I told her the other day, I said, um, I really admire people that have been married 50 years. And in order for us to accomplish that objective, I think God's going to keep me here till I'm 83. Cause that's, that's, that's what it takes for us to cross the line. And I remind I reminded her that she has to be here too, so that we can successfully say that. That's good. And then I want my time to be first because I don't I don't really want to be here without her. So that's, that's awesome. so next question here, Coach. What is the biggest I'm so glad I took that risk story of your life? I'm so glad I took that risk. Going back to land air. Um so I left Land Air in 95 and started a um, warehousing supply chain business. And then um, there was a split between Land Air and Forward Air. And it, it, people weren't really going to understand all that, but there was a company left called Land Air that struggled. And um, Scott, my mentor and partner, asked me to come back and uh, run the company. as a, It was a public company when I first went back. But I had a pretty good life with this supply chain business. I was making a really good living. I was working about six hours a day and day trading about two hours a day. I just had a new family. And when Scott came to me, and, and, you know, first he came to me and said, what do you think I ought to do with this business? I was just sell it. And then the second time he came to me, he said, what do you think I ought to do with this business? I said, sell it. He said, I think you ought to come back and fix it. And I'm like, oh, man, don't do that to me. I I got a great life here. I'm doing just fine. And um, I've got this family thing. And, man, that's going to be a big undertaking that I really didn't want, quite frankly. And then third time he came back, he said, I really need you to do this. And uh, of course, you know, I think it's probably came out how grateful I am for all that he did in the turning point in my life. Um, so I went that following Sunday, I walk into my Sunday school and I'm in there by myself and the teacher comes in before everybody gets there. And she can tell that I'm perplexed about something and I describe it to her. And she basically said, I think you ought to do it. And for me, that was hearing God say. So wow. you know, the next wow. morning I go to my go to Scott's office and I'm just like, I'm gonna do it. I'll be here on this day. Of course, he wants to bring the attorneys in and everything. I'm like, just figure it out. You've always been fair to me. I'm not doing this. For the money, I'm partially doing it to show you can be done, but I'm really doing it because I'm called to do it. And you figure out the rest of the work. And um, you know, it it was a turning point in my my life, my family's life. But it was just such a phenomenal journey. I mean, there was 18 years of a lot. A lot of people, a lot of experiences, a lot of growing, a lot of failing. You know, people don't talk about that. Right? Where there's growth, there's failure. Yeah, there was a lot. You, you of can't grow without failure. <laughs> there was a lot of failing, especially on my behalf. But um, I, without failing, there is no growth. How do you know? Well, I didn't want to do this, and I almost didn't. I mean, I'd already deterred Scott, so he was kind of off my back. And um, but I, something was was 
weighing on me, I guess. And then when I heard Terry, our Sunday school teacher, say, I think you know, there's just like this powerful voice speaking to me. And I'm like, okay. Uh, you often Did she hear, know what you were struggling with? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I describe it to her. Okay. Uh, I tried to keep the names out of it, but I described it to her. Awesome. Wow. That's awesome. Last question, Coach. Drum row. What is your winning edge? Or you can say, what is your special sauce? What persistence. makes you tick? Persistence. I, I'm really slow, my wife will tell you to decide to commit to something. But once once I'm in, it's just persistence. You know, there's a lot of times I've been privileged to be able to make things happen. As a matter of fact, when I was young, I used to be inspired to do things nobody thought could happen. And the only way that we I, you would see success is just because God's grace and lack of willingness to give up. Mm. There, I've had people tell me before I should give. <laughs> I want I want to slow down here a little bit. I want everybody to hear that. A lack of willingness to give up. To give up. You just can't. Lack of willingness to give up. Wow. That was it. That's good. I mean, I wasn't so, smart. You know, I mean, I don't have a pedigree. I'm not overly intelligent as you can tell i'm not great looking yeah you're a good looking coach my, my wife says i have a gift for gab and i'm kind of a words man but oh, that's all that's all i had going for me is some words and like a willingness to give up as a matter of fact that's how i got her it took me three years so you, babe ruth you a fan of babe ruth yes yeah he, he's got a quote it's hard to beat a person that never gives up. Because they'll be back. You, know, you just can't give up. So, hey, thank you so much for coming hey. on here and sharing your stories and how people's inspired you. And you've just dropped a ton of nuggets on us today. And maybe the title of this is is to never give up. Amen. It could be, you know, could be persistence. It could be, you know, take risk on people. You know, Give people room to make mistakes. Uh, Accountability is a big thing. Especially today. Accountability is a big iron sharpens iron. So thank you, John, for being here. My and pleasure. It's been fun. Amen. Audience, write those three things down. I challenge you in the intro to write three things down. Now, I want you to be a very effective leader. Now you got to figure out the most powerful thing to do. What's that one domino that can knock the rest of the dominoes issues out of the way? So as one of my mentors told me, he said, Greg, once you figure out the most impactful things to do, you'll be further ahead than everybody else. So Amen. thank you, John, for being here. Thank you for all the listeners listening. God bless you all. Go have a great day and inspire someone to do something that they will not do by themselves. Thank you all very much.